Welcome to Lesson 1C, Axes Transformation Rules for Tensors. In this lesson, we'll define and describe the cosine matrix. We'll discuss rules for axis transformation, in particular axis rotation, when we're dealing with tensors of any order. We'll define a proper tensor, and I'll do a couple example problems involving axis rotation. First, we'll define a cosine matrix. Here it is in tensor notation. Cij is cosine alpha ij, where alpha ij is the angle between the old i and the new j axes. So i is old and j is new. In this notation, unprimed coordinates x1, x2, and x3 are the original axes, and primed coordinates are the rotated axes. In my sketch, the green unprimed axes are the original and the blue primed coordinates are the rotated axes. I note that this sketch is two-dimensional, but we can easily extend this to three dimensions out of the plane. Using this definition of alpha ij, alpha 1, 1 is the angle from the original or old axis 1 to the new axis 1, shown here. And similarly, alpha 2, 2 is the angle between the original x2 and the new x2. Here I've rotated about the x3 axis coming out of the plane at an angle of about 30 degrees. This is the angle between the original x2 axis and the new x1 axis. So by our definition, that one is alpha 2, 1. Similarly, the angle between the original or old x1 to the new x2, by our definition of i and j, makes this angle alpha 1, 2. Let's do an example of how we apply this cosine matrix to a vector. Suppose we have velocity vector u with these two components in the x1, x2 plane. Now we rotate the axes by 30 degrees counterclockwise in the x1, x2 plane, as shown here. Let's calculate the components of u in this rotated coordinate system. Here's our vector u. You can see from these components that it's tilted up a little bit more than 45 degrees. Let's calculate the cosine matrix. I'll do only the two-dimensional components. Alpha 1, 1 is 30 degrees, so C11 1, 1 is cosine of 30 degrees, which is square root of 3 over 2. We can see from the sketch that alpha 1, 2 is 90 plus 30, or 120 degrees, so C12 1, 2 is negative 1 half. Similarly, alpha 2, 1 is 90 minus 30, or 60 degrees, so C21 1 is 1 half. And then C22 2 is also square root of 3 over 2, since alpha 2, 2 is also 30 degrees. To calculate the components of u prime in this rotated coordinate system, since we're talking about a vector, the equation is u prime m is c i m u i. I'll discuss this more formally in a minute. For now, let's just use this equation to calculate these components. Note here that m is a free index. It's not repeated, whereas i is repeated. So for m equal 1, 2, or 3, we have to sum over the i's. So u1 prime is c11 u1 plus c21 u2 plus c31 u3. Notice that I've kept m equal to 1, but I've summed i equal 1 to 3. Plugging in our cosine matrix and the original components u1 and u2, where for this 2D problem, anything with a 3 subscript is 0. I get 3.7236 meters per second to three digits in my final answer. u1 prime is 3.72 meters per second. Similarly, u2 prime is c12 u1 plus c22 u2 plus c32 u3. Again, this last term is 0. I plug in c12 from up here times u1 plus c22 times u2. I get 1.1295, or to three digits, 1.13 meters per second. I always like to do what I call a sanity check. The speed squared, or the magnitude of the velocity squared, is the sum of the squares of all its components. In this case, u3 is 0. In our transformed coordinates, we must also have the same equation. In other words, the same speed. The actual speed does not change when we change coordinates. Let's check this. In our original coordinates, I get 15.14 meters squared per second squared. And in my transformed coordinates, I also get 15.14 meters squared per second squared. To four digits, these agree, but our answers are good only to three digits, since the given information had only three digits. As an additional sanity check, here's the original u1 and the original u2. In the transformed coordinates, this is u prime 1 and this is u prime 2. 
we can see that u1 prime has to be greater than the original u1 and u2 prime is less than the original u2. This also agrees with our answers. Here's a summary of the rules for axis transformation or axis rotation in particular for tensors of any order. A tensor of order 0 has only one element. It's a zero order tensor, which is a scalar. When we transform the axis, nothing changes. So A prime is A. For a vector, we have three elements. It's a first order tensor, which we call a vector. This is the equation I just used. A prime M equals C I M A I. A second order tensor, usually just called a tensor, has nine elements, two free indices. And we extend this by having two free indices here and two cosine matrices. We can continue with third, fourth, or nth order tensor. The number of free indices here is equal to the order of the tensor, as is the number of cosine matrices that are strung together. You can see the pattern in the way we have defined the indices of these cosine matrices. Now I'll define a proper tensor, which means it's mathematically proper or correct. Any proper tensor must obey the above axis transformation rules. In other words, when we rotate the axes, the components of the rotated tensor must follow these equations. And this applies to tensors of any order. Now I'll do another example using a second order tensor. The pressure component of the stress tensor is given by this in matrix form. Pressure acts inward normal on the surfaces of any fluid element where the normals of these faces are aligned with the axes. Now suppose we rotate the axes by 30 degrees about the x1 axis. Mathematically positive counterclockwise means that alpha 2 2 and alpha 3 3 are 30 degrees. Let's calculate the pressure component of this stress tensor in these new rotated coordinates. From our table for a second order tensor, we had a prime mn equals c i m c j n a i j. Again, m and n are free variables, but i and j are both repeated, so we sum up over i and j. Here, t prime m n pressure equals c i m c j n t i j pressure. This is the equation we'll use to do our transformation. Well, first we must calculate the cosine matrix, which is cosine alpha i j, remembering that i represents the old axes and j represents the new axes. This can get difficult to draw in three dimensions. This is my original x1 and x2 axes, and x3 is out of the page. We're rotating 30 degrees around the x1 axis. So x2 prime gets rotated 30 degrees, as does x3 prime. This angle is alpha 2 2, which is 30 degrees. This angle is alpha 3 3, which is also 30 degrees. Alpha 2, 3 goes from the old 2 axis to the new 3 axis. That's 90 plus 30 or 120 degrees. Alpha 3, 2 is from the old 3 axis to the new 2 axis. Notice that these alphas are not symmetric. Alpha 2, 3 does not equal alpha 3, 2. Alpha 1, 2 is 90 degrees. Since we're rotating about the x1 axis, we've simply rotated the x2 and x3 axes, but the angle between the old x1 and the new x2 prime is still 90 degrees. Similarly, alpha 1, 3 is 90 degrees, and alpha 3, 1 is 90 degrees. Alpha 2, 1 is 90 degrees, and finally alpha 1, 1 is 0 degrees, since there's no change in the x1 axis. x1 prime is the same as x1 in this case. Now that we have all these angles, we can calculate the cosine matrix. Cij is cosine of alpha ij. In matrix form, we write cosine alpha 1, 1, cosine alpha 1, 2, cosine alpha 1, 3 for the first row, and similarly for the second row and the third row. Plugging in all our alphas from the above diagram, we end up with 1, 0, 0. 0 square root of 3 over 2, negative 1 half. 0, 1 half square root of 3 over 2. Now that we have the cosine matrix, we must use this equation to get our transform stress tensor. I rewrite that equation here. You can see that it would be very tedious to put all of these in, but it turns out that we could work on this part first. This amounts to saying that for each i and n, we sum over j, since in this circled part, the i and the n are free indices, but j is repeated. I'll make myself a little table, i, n, and then calculate this part. When i and n are both 1, we have C11, T11 pressure, plus C21, T12 pressure, plus C31, T13 pressure. This first term is 1 from our cosine matrix, and negative P 
from our original tensor in the original axes. C21 and C31 are both 0. So our final answer is that when i and n are both 1, we get negative p. You can repeat this for all combinations of i and n. And you can try this on your own. I'll do the case for i equal 2 and n equal 2. Again, just this blue portion gives us these three terms when we sum over j. And when we plug in our values, we get negative square root of 3 over 2 times pressure. If you continue this for all the cases, you quickly see a pattern. Namely, it turns out that this term that we circled in blue up here simplifies to negative cin times p, where these terms follow the same pattern as the cosine matrix itself. So this term is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, square root of 3 over 2 times negative p, etc. So this greatly simplifies our analysis because now we can use this equation and substitute what's circled in blue here with what's circled in blue here. I'll rewrite the equation for T prime MN pressure as negative CIM CIN times P. And since P is just a scalar, we can write negative P CIM CIN. Again, we can make ourselves a table to do these calculations. Here we see that M and N are free variables and we must sum over I. When M and N are both 1, we get negative P, and now summing over I's, C11, C11, plus C21, C21, plus C31, C31, and plugging in our components for the cosine matrix, we get negative P. Similarly, for M equal 1 and N equal 2, we get negative P times the sum of these three terms, and when we plug in our values, we get 0. We can continue for all the possible combinations of M and N. There are nine of them. I'll do one more here, namely 2, 2. I get these three terms. And when I plug in the components of the cosine matrix, it turns out that these two terms add up to 1, so we get negative p. We repeat for all combinations of m and n. And again, you are welcome to try this on your own. My final result for the rotated t prime mn pressure is negative p, 0, 0, 0, negative p, 0, 0, 0, negative p, which is the same as our original tij pressure. In other words, all these calculations we did ended up yielding exactly the same tensor. This is a unique situation. It works because this is an isotropic tensor. Physically, the pressure is the same at any surface regardless of the axes. In our original axes, if we have some fluid element aligned with the axes, the pressure is normal to any surface. In our rotated axes, and again with an element that's aligned with these axes, the same pressure, which is a force per unit area, acts on any of these faces. This would be the case regardless of how we rotate the axes. That's because this is an isotropic tensor. For a general tensor, when we rotate the axes, all nine of these will change. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.